Goku is extremely undecided about what decision he should make. He was already aware about the great dangers that it was to leave the beings of that planet alive. However, for him, it was impossible to destroy an entire planet with countless lives. Even more, Goku, that was a great emotional attachment to the Yod Rat race. Goku says to Vados, Miss Vados, take me there. First, I want to talk to them. Clearly disapproving this, Vados asks, Talk? I don't think it will be doing any good. Lord Goku, I've been watching this person's behavior for a few years, and I've never seen any signal for them to switch sides. But the Saiyan God insists. I need to try. I want you to take me there. Without options, Vados agrees and says, All right, then let's go. And then Vados and Goku entered the planet at high speed. And when they reached the ground immediately, dozens of warriors of the Yodrat race appeared on the place. And thus, all the Yodrats surrounded Goku and Vados. However, when they saw Goku's outfit as a god of destruction, they all bowed without thinking twice. And then Goku extremely serious asks, Which of you is the elder of this planet? One of the Yodrat informs that the elder of the planet was not there. But suddenly, one Yodrat appeared before Goku using his instant transmission. He compliments the visitors. Hello, God of Destruction. My name is Piberi, and I am the Elder Master of this planet. What do I owe the honor of your visit? Goku is extremely surprised by the name of the Yadrat. He thinks, Piberi? Even his name is identical to Mr. Paibara's name, the Elder from Universe 7. After thinking about that, Goku says, I heard you guys are causing a mess on the other planets. Tell me, why are you doing this? Piberi tries to explain by saying, I knew those barbarians on the other side would end up causing trouble. I apologize to you, sir. Lately, our planet has been facing a major crisis, a civil war. Our people are totally divided into two sides. Unfortunately, we share different ideas. While we use our abilities to secure the lives of our people, barbarians prefer to spread chaos without any empathy. Hearing this history, Goku believes, and then he asks, So that means that this is all the fault of the beings on the other side? Piberi confirms and says, Exactly. In recent months, we've been trying to stop them. However, all our attacks end in defeat. It's impossible to control those bastards. After thinking about what to do, Goku asks, Tell me, Mr. Piberi, where are these barbarians? Piberi politely says, Come, Lord Goku, I will take you to them. Hearing the odd rat saying his name, Goku is very surprised. Since he never said his name to him, Goku was about to ask, Wait, how do you... But Piberi already knows what he was going to ask, and then replies, How do I know your name? Well, as you are the most important god in the universe, I took the liberty of learning your name. Vados explains more directly to Goku. Lord Goku, this man has just read your mind. The Yadrat Master says to Vados, I see. So you also have the same skills, right? The angel replies with sarcasm. Let's just say I know a few tricks. Piberi wants to end this conversation and so he calls them. Piberi says, Come my friends, hold on to me, I will take you to the barbarians. Piberi, Goku, and Vados disappeared with the instant transmission and thus reappeared in a very distant region, a mountainous region. Arriving there, Goku was severely attacked by all the Yadrat who were in the place. Goku didn't understand anything. He didn't understand why all that aggressiveness from those beings of the Yadrat race all appeared to be wild animals without any kind of conscience. And then after dodging and blocking several blows from those warriors, Goku comes to a conclusion. He says, Mr. Pibara, you just saved your planet from destruction. Thanks for showing me where the problem was. Bibari asks, What are you going to do, Lord Goku? Vados, presuming what Goku was about to do, asks with a disapproving tone, Lord Goku, are you sure about this? Decided about what he's going to do, the God of Destruction replies, I've already made my decision. And then Goku stretches out his hand and says, Hakai! And so all the barbarians simply vanish into dust. At that time, all Yadrat teleport to Goku's side, and everyone started to party, started to celebrate the disappearance of the barbarians. Very happy, Piberi says to Goku, I never thought I'd say this, but thank you, Lord the God of Destruction. I will send my students to prepare a great feast for you. I notice that you are hungry. Hearing about a feast, Goku gets very excited and then he says, Food? Really? How awesome! It's been quite a while since I ate some delicious food. But Vados intervenes. Wait, Lord Goku, remember you're grounded. You shouldn't eat anything for the next few months. Now Goku is very sad. He begs to her. What? Just one? Miss Vados, please! 
but the angel is really tough. No, sir, you're grounded. And then Vados drags Goku off the planet, and they go back to the planet of destruction to continue their activities. Three weeks later, Goku is sleeping soundly when Vados comes to him. Vados says, Mr. Goku, wake up, Mr. Goku. The destroyer complains. Why did you wake me up so early? Vados tells him the news. Something just happened. I believe you'll want to know. It's about planet Earth. Goku gets very tense and asks, What happened to Earth? The angel says, Pay attention, Lord Goku. I don't think you're going to like what I'm going to tell you. When we went to Planet Yardrat to talk to the Elder Master, I think you remember how he found out that your name was Goku? Remembering what happened, Goku confirms. Yes, I remember. You told me he read my mind at the time. Vados continues the history. Apparently, by reading your mind, he didn't just get the information of what your name was. He also managed to find out that you were raised on a tiny blue planet called Earth. Until now, Goku is not understanding what she wants to say. He says, okay, but what does this mean? The time I killed all the barbarians, didn't I? In a moment, Vados finally explains, Lord Goku, there was never ever a civil war on that planet. You've been tricked. Elder Pibari was the real villain of the history. He controlled the minds of half of his faithful to make you believe he was a victim there. Goku gets very surprised with that information. No, it's impossible. This cannot be true. Then Vados continues with the bad news. She says, Pipari, when reading your mind, realized that you wouldn't have the courage to destroy the entire planet. So he took advantage of that very well. After tricking you, Pibari and all his followers teleported to the planet Earth of Universe 6 and killed all the humans, wiping out the planet completely. That was the end of the line for Goku. No, 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 that's a lie. Goku starts to get extremely sad, angry and confused. All that guilt was starting to take over his mind. Punishing the destroyer, Vados continues with hard words. You were the culprit. The entire planet Earth was completely destroyed. The Yadrat concealed their presence with some of their special abilities. Now not even I am able to locate them. At that time, guilt, regret, sadness and hatred began to merge with the energy of destruction. Goku would again explode his body in rage. The energy of destruction was killing the Saiyan. Goku's energy was so dense, it was so intense, that the planets around the planet of destruction began to get destroyed. Only the presence of energy coming out of Goku's body began to affect the entire universe and the entire other world. Even the Lord Enma Dayo of Universe 6 was scared. He, seeing the situation, seeing all the energy, came to a single conclusion. Enma Dayo thinks, if that guy doesn't control that energy, he will destroy the entire universe completely. And when everything seemed to be the end because of Goku's out of control, the Saiyan simply faints. However, when he passes out, Goku's consciousness entered a kind of another dimension. The same dimension he used to find the energy of destruction. Back in his first days of training with Vados, Goku waking up to the other dimension inside his body was extremely calm. Confused, he asks himself, why am I here? What happened with me? And then Goku hears a voice just above him. It's the voice of Kakarot. Finally, I can talk to you in person. What do you call you anyway? Son Goku, right? And then Goku looking up realizes that there was someone extremely similar to him. He replies, who are you? Why do you look like me? The mysterious man replies, do I look like you? Don't make me laugh. You're the one who looks like me. I'm the original Saiyan. Goku gets even more confused and then he orders, explain yourself now. With a sarcastic tone, the mysterious man says, well, well, is the good-hearted Saiyan Lord angry? I think I should introduce myself. The mysterious figure that looked like Goku advances at high speed and appears before the Saiyan, and with a single movement, he pierces the Saiyan's chest, which immediately makes Goku immediately fall to the ground. After doing this, he says, Did you ask who I am? Well, I call myself Kakarot, and I am the energy of destruction itself. A few hours later, Goku regains consciousness and without understanding what was happening, he opens his eyes and finds Kakarot turned on his back and looking at the void of that dimension. Angry, Goku asks to Kakarot, So you mean that all this time you were causing me those weird sensations when I turned into a Super Saiyan God? He replies, I tried. I tried to become the real destruction this universe always needed. But you know what? After so many attempts, I never made it. Goku doesn't understand what he means. He asks, What are you talking about? And Kakarot explains better. Son Goku, a Saiyan found on Earth when you were still a child. It was adopted by an old martial arts artist named Son Gohan. Since then, purity and goodness have taken over your heart.
sparing the lives of the enemies. Even when they killed all your friends. Piccolo. Vegeta. Freeze. Majin Buu. Honestly, whose idea was it to turn such an idiot into a god of destruction? Goku justifies. Listen, I never wanted to become a god. It really doesn't suit me. I can't kill millions of people and wipe out planets as easily as those guys. However, I'm doing this for two reasons. The first is that I don't have much choice. Lord Zeno put me here. And second, I need to get stronger at all costs. My friends need me. Kakarot is very surprised with that information and says, What? Were you the great chosen of the Omni Kings? This is a big surprise for me. Look, Goku, I don't want to kill you. I just want to switch places with you. You admitted that you are not capable of destroying a planet. You proved it by sparing those guys from Yardrat. And look what happened. The planet Earth with millions of innocent people ended up suffering the consequences. You need to understand that the post of a god of destruction requires making difficult decisions and not hesitating when something needs to be done. A god's duty is simply to maintain balance in his universe. Whether creating or destroying, there is no bad side or good side in this situation. There is only what needs to be done. Today you hesitated and look what happened. A god of destruction treated you like a fool. You will become a joke in all universes. Nobody will respect you, Goku, unless we make a deal. After hearing that, Goku gets curious. A deal? What do you mean by that? The energy of destruction explains. Well, it's a fact that you can't control me. But unfortunately, I wasn't able to control you. So we are at an impasse. You cannot activate my power, and I cannot switch places with you. But Goku, more confused, stopped Kakarot's speech to make a question. Switch places with me? I do not understand. Kakarot gets more angrier, and he replies, You're dumber than a door. To summarize, we are currently within a dimension created in your mind. This is where I belong from the moment you became a god. But unfortunately, I'm locked in this place. I don't have the freedom to make my own decisions. I'm a beast caged inside you, Goku. So my biggest goal since appearing in this place was trying to get out of here somehow. But every time I tried to do that, I almost killed you, or took an entire universe with me. Which, of course, I don't want that to happen, because if you die, I'll disappear too. So I've been thinking, why can't I switch places with you? And after a while, I realized where the big problem was. The problem is that you, Goku, may be a guy with the most powerful body in the universe, but your mind isn't ready for my power. The proof of this is that every time I switch places with you, your mind would succumb in a matter of seconds, and you would soon fall unconscious. So I thought of a solution. Why not bring him in the next time and try to strike a deal with him? That's what I'm trying to do. I brought you here, Goku, to try to solve our problems. I know you know that no matter how hard you try, no matter how hard you're training, you will never make it at this rate. But one thing I assure you, I am your only chance to master this power. Goku's still confused about Kakarot's intentions and then he asks, You mean you're going to teach me how to use the power of destruction? And he explains better. Not exactly. You see, your body is already strong enough to easily withstand all the power I can offer you. But if your mind is not prepared for that power, you'll never make it, and maybe you'll end up killing yourself. So I found a solution to prepare you for the energy of destruction. Now Goku is a little more excited. Goku says, what kind of solution? Any special training? The energy of destruction continues his explanation. That's not the problem, Goku. Since your childhood, you have always trained your body and mind. So your mind is almost as strong as your body. What you need is preparation. All the reason you don't have that preparation is just that. When you were little, you ended up falling off a big cliff, and after hitting your head hard, you lost a part of you. All your Saiyan memories were lost. You were never complete, and that's the main reason you're not prepared for the energy of destruction. To be able to control it, you first need to regain your Saiyan essence. Now Goku is finally understanding something, and says, So all this time, the reason I couldn't make it was my, my bump on the head when I was a boy? And Kakarot confirms. Exactly. It's pretty simple, so let me explain. With my power of destruction, I am not only able to destroy anything, but I am also able to use a mental ability called Mental Verse Creation, an ability that allows me to send someone's mind anywhere from whatever time they've been. In this ability, a parallel universe is created inside the person's mind. That is, with this ability, I can send you to the planet of the Saiyans about 43 years ago. If you accept this, after a few months on the planet, I believe you will be ready to control the destruction. Goku is a little worried about this idea. Goku says, send me to the past. 
You mean I have to travel back in time and change something like Trunks did that time? Kakarot explains better. Listen, Goku, I can't send you to the real past. That's impossible and forbidden even for a god. What I can do is create a kind of illusory universe. That, it is a perfect copy of the original. Only, not in the physical world, but in your mind. So I will not send you to the past. I will send your mind to a kind of copy of Universe 7 from 43 years ago. So if you do something different there, it won't create a time ring or problems in the real world, as everything is just an illusory world in your mind. When I bring you back, this copy will simply be destroyed. But illusion or not, you will prepare your mind and will be ready and complete to master the Hakai energy. Goku is a little suspicious about all this and says, You told me this is the only way to master this power, but what do you get out of this? And he explains, Now we come to the most interesting part. I managed to leave this universe open for the period of five months, and this time is over. The universe will be erased and you will be back. When you return, I believe you are already prepared for the Hakai energy. At that time, we will face each other, and if you win, I will give you control of the energy of destruction, and you will finally have what you desire in its maximum power. But when I win, I'll be able to switch places with you forever. I will have control over your body and mind. So what do you say? Do you accept the challenge? Goku smiles and gives an answer. Of course I do, but I will defeat you no matter what. Very confident. Kakarot says, actually I defeated you with just a single blow. It's not about how strong you are, it's how prepared you are. Despite that, Goku says, I will win. I accept this deal. And then Kakarot and Goku shake hands, sealing the deal. Kakarot makes a hand sign, closing his eyes and says, Mental verse creation. So a small portal opens in front of Goku. And before Goku enters that place and goes to his home planet, Kakarot says, Hey Goku, what you do there will not affect the real world. But it does affect the happenings of the world while you're there. So to avoid confusion, I recommend that you don't say your name or who you are. You need to mix in the middle of the others. So don't say that your name is Goku. That name has no say in origin. You would be seen as a suspect. Goku thinks about that and asks, Should I say they call me Kakarot then? Kakarot says, No. Your version from that world has already been born, and it's called Kakarot. That would be weird. You need another Saiyan name. Goku doesn't know what to do, and says, Oh damn, I can't think of anything. Hey, you don't know any other names, do you? Kakarot has an idea. Let's see. How about Turles? Turles? Nice name. Well then, here I go, says Goku. And then the Saiyan runs towards the portal, but before entering, Kakarot shouts from afar. Hey, wait! You can't get there in that god's outfit! And then Kakarot snaps his fingers, and Goku completely changes his outfit. He likes the outfit. Goku says, cool. Now I look like Vegeta when he arrived on Earth that time. Then Kakarot tells him to go. Come on, Goku. I can only keep this universe open for five months. Goku go while saying, right, soon I will return to defeat you. And then Goku enters the portal and appears on planet Vegeta from 43 years ago. Gilmore lay in a scene of despair on the top of a hill. The bodies of his fellow from Elite 16 who had failed in the mission to collect energy from the Earthlings for the awakening of Zarat were scattered. Each of them died by the clutches of the newly arrived Nine Dominations, the only team in the service of the Celestial Mages that was more powerful than they. Gilmer creates two energy shurikens in his hands, launching them at the leader of the Nine Dominations. Gilmer says, take that! This is for my friends, bastard! The attack is destroyed into particles after Gilmer reneges with a wave of his hand. Gilmer says, why did you do that? We serve the same master. Susei says, you are aware of the condition since you entered. The leader says, failing a quest in the service of the Celestial Mages only means one thing. And he raises his right hand carrying red energy as he finishes his sentence and says, death. And so Gilmer's life is taken. A woman who is part of the Nine Domination says, at least Arakos' team managed to collect a good amount of energy, said Kor. But I'm really curious about the power of these Earthlings. How about taking a look around? To which the leader responds, I make your words my words. I'm sensing two rising energies a little far away from here. If we're quick, we'll get there in time and see who they are. Come on, Nine Dominations. Let's see what these Earthlings are capable of and confirm that we didn't make a hasty judgment on the Elite 16. They head towards the source of power they are feeling. Goten and Trunks continued their match against Cell's juniors, who totaled seven. Transformed into Super Saiyan 2, they glided above the trees of Monster Island, clashing their fists and delivering high-impact kicks pressured by the speed and combination of the little warrior's powers. Goten yells, Masenko! Goten fires a golden flash as he raises his hand to his forehead, looking for two of the Cell Juniors that were hit squarely. Goku's son celebrates and says, Got you this time! 
but he is dismayed to see that they regenerate their bodies at high speed. The two stuck their tongues out teasing Goten. Cell Jr. says, You won't be able to catch us again, you asshole. Cell Juniors generate a Kienzan by raising their arms, launch the technique at Goten, who narrowly deflects the attack then obliterates him with energy balls. Relieved to escape the latest attack, Goten says, That was close. But wait, where's Trunks? At that moment, a burst of golden energy occurs beneath the skies, revealing Trunks emerging from the midst of the line of fire of five junior cells. Trunks says, Run, Goten. They are getting more and more bloodthirsty. Goten and Trunks stand side by side, both with Super Saiyan 2 powers. Trunks says, We will have to fight together if we want to have any chance. If we awaken the Super Saiyan 3, we will win easily. Goten looks around to see Cell Junior surrounding them. And then he says, Now! Both start an incessant fire of golden energy balls that are invading the creature's attack field. Goten yells, Are you enjoying this? But then an unfamiliar voice echoes. It's Takebe, and he says, Very much. Ravenous flames invade the place, setting fire on everything. Takebe says, Burn! Burn, Earthlings, burn! The author of the attack was Takebe, one of the nine dominations in the service of their leader, Susei. At that instant, number 17, which was patrolling the island, was on alert, creating a defensive shield at the place where the newly arrived enemies revealed themselves. He was there and lying in wait, contemplated the current scenario. Nine warriors lay face to face with Goten, Trunks, and the Cells, each with their very peculiar appearance. Android 17 thinks, If I reveal my presence, I won't be able to protect the animals effectively. I'd better leave the problem to Goten, Trunks, and the others, and hope they have the wisdom to guide the fight away from here. Furious by having his training interrupted by someone who clearly had bad intentions, Goten asked the visitors, What do you want from us? Do you belong to that evil group that invaded Earth not long ago? Another member of the enemy group, Jishin, reveals, Don't you dare compare us with those weak from Elite 16. We are the Nine Dominations, the most powerful team of warriors in the service of the Celestial Mages. Susei, the leader, reveals, We are here because we feel your energy, and we think you might be interesting, as many of the Elite 16 worms have failed in their mission to defeat the Earthlings and gather the energy needed for the Supreme Being to awaken. Showing a provocative smile, Trunks asks, So, you're here to fight with us. Looks like we're getting important. Goten, it's time for us to fight side by side with our little friends here. What do you think of the idea, little cell juniors? One of the little creatures exclaims, Looks like it will be fun. Come on, guys. Get rid of them with them. Putting herself on guard, the woman named Kor says, It was easier than I thought. Permission to kill, Lord Susei? The leader responds, Permission granted. Susei faces the group of warriors coming towards him with a slight smile. When the clash occurs in the gale, the warriors disperse in one-on-one -on -one combat at full speed. Goten faces off against Takebe while Trunks faces off against Jinshin. The rest of them, Susei, Kyofu, Kinsoku, Buraza, Kor, Yogan, and Mokusai faced the Cell Juniors, who were now fighting separately. Laughing, the enemy leader shouts, You're not worth anything. You're nothing but trash, said Susei, as he delivers a palm swipe that reveals itself in a colossal pulse of water. Behold, a torrent of stones runs through the air, as Trunks is destroying with his punches and kicks until he finds himself face to face with Jinshin. The boy comments, What strange powers! Do you use the energy of nature to fight? Trunks extends his right arm, charging energy as Jinshin explains. We actually use our own energy. But yes, we can easily connect with the energy around us. Jinshin easily breaks through Trunks. Big bang attack, grabbing the boy by the neck and diving with him in a high-speed spiral with both hitting the ground. After doing this, he continues the explanation. Each of us master one of nature's nine essential elements. That's where our organization's name comes from. Of course, hearing that before death is irrelevant to you. Trunks lands a kick on Jinshin's sensible regions in time to avoid the warrior's final blow, who is now making a comical expression of pain. The boy says, If you're thinking it's going to be that easy, you need to review your concepts. Big Bang Attack! By moving his hands at high speeds, he shoots golden energy balls, which Jinshin directs to his face. Nearby, crossing the torrent of fire that spreads through the skies, Goten invades Takebe's attack field, throwing punches and kicks that the invader was dodging and hitting. Goten punches Takebe straight in the stomach until he realizes something. Goten says, Ouch! My hand is burning! He sees that the fist he used to hit Takebe is slightly scorched. The boy complains, What are you made of? The flame mage replies, When I'm connected to the world around me, my whole body becomes a glowing mass of pure heat. 
Takebe laughs evilly and continues his speech. <laughs> Whoever touches my body will burn more and more until he can't fight anymore. Do you want to continue? Goten responds. It just means I have to avoid direct contact. Goten guides the arms to the right side of the body and concentrates a blue energy. Kamehameha! He smiles as he fires the energy cannon at Takebe. Takebe summons a pillar of fire colored energy against Goten's Kamehameha, saving himself from destruction. After doing so, the invading mage says, We're just getting started, kid. I believe it will be interesting. After all, you're much stronger than your little friends. Goten is surprised and worried by those words. Goten says, What are you talking about? Goten looks in the direction where Takebe pointed, seeing that the Cell's juniors were having a hard time against the other members of the Nine Dominations. Goten says, I see, when they fight together that can create combinations of attacks that easily overwhelm us. But fighting alone isn't as powerful as they seem. Takebe adds, They will fall one by one into the hands of my dear friends. Takebe envelops his body in blazing flames as he says, Just as you will fall through my hands. Kyofu creates a whirlwind that lifts one of the Cell Juniors aloft, hitting him with overwhelming air pressure. Kinzoku delivers a blow with a silver blade generated from his own arm, breaking the shoulder of one of the little cells. Huraza traps one of them in a clear fluid in the ground, firing a shot straight into its head. Kor freezes the body of one of them, who was trying to free himself by devouring the ice around him. And Yogan ambushes another leading the lava stream in pursuit, making him run for his life. Mokusai drives a stump into the seventh body, now aiming to deliver the final blow to his head. Seeing all these things going on, Trunks says, Damn it, the Cell Juniors aren't doing it by fighting separately. Trunks analyzes this while dodging the gigantic rock thrown by Jinshin. And after doing so, he continues, If it continues like this, our training partners will be destroyed. Trunks launches himself into Jinshin's body, hitting him with a high-powered punch, launching him like a meteor towards the sea. Cell Juniors were running away from the onslaught of the seven invading warriors, grouping themselves on a rock, placing their hands on each other's shoulders. They begin to glow with an opaque aura vaporizing from their body. They all say at the same time, If we can't beat them alone, then we'll do it together as one. A flash floods the battlefield, leaving the members of the Nine Dominations surprised. Cell says, What nostalgia to fight with this old body of mine. After the glare fades from the battlefield, the warrior reveals himself to everyone's surprise, with black wings and what appears to be a helmet on his head. The little Cell Juniors had grown into a single, incredibly powerful warrior. Cell says, What nostalgia to fight using this old body of mine. Cell says as he reveals his perfect form, this time with his skin colored a little blue instead of green. Seeing the enemy that appears in front of him, Kyofu says, So, you were just part of another being. This is getting interesting. Cell explains. Actually, we were all Cell's children. By using a technique called assimilation, coming from Piccolo's DNA inside us, we can unite the seven into one, becoming a faithful copy of our father. But we are much more powerful. Hearing all this, Susei, the leader of the Nine Domination, says, That's what we're going to see. Come on, Dominations. Together we'll tear him to pieces. Don't be fooled by appearances. With a smile on his face, Cell says, Let the massacre begin. Cell begins firing shots of golden energy which invaded the area where his opponents were, forcing them to spread themselves. As he does this, the newly born warrior says, Come on, you miserable bastards. Come to death. As he charges at Cell, Kyofu yells, Dragon fists! Kyofu slides in a low flight, taking his fist towards Cell's chin, who dodges but is carried away by the wind coming from the attack. Being thrown backwards where Kinzoku lay ready with his right hand transfigured into a metal club. She screams, Silver Club! Kinzoku sends the club spinning in his arm against Cell's back, piercing his body. Cell takes his palms back and fires golden energy shots, which hit Kinzoku causing her to recoil injured as he faces the arrival of Puraza, Kori, and Yugan. Very wounded, Kinzoku asks his companions, Finish him off for me. Kinzoku free falls, shedding blood. The first of the group to attack Cell is Puraza. Plasma detonation, says Puraza, who summons at that moment a torrential rain of sticky plasma that runs through the area where Cell was, covering his body and limiting his movements. In doing so, she says to the others, Now folks, this is our chance to avenge Kinzoku. Whoever decides to take this opportunity first is Kori. Ice Spears! Kori launches several Ice Spears which pierce Cell's body, giving Yogan space to perform his attack without any problems. 
Corey says, Finish him, Yogan. Yogan appears, shooting a blast of lava from the open palms of his hands. Die, you monster! Eruption of darkness! Cell is hit, full on by the lava torrent. The three warriors gaze at his charred body when they hear a crack inside the burned carapace. Cell with light blue skin is unharmed, putting his palms to his forehead, shouting, Taiyoken! The white flash invades the battlefield, blinding Peraza, Kori, and Yogan. Doing so, the android says, It's over for you. Seeing what was about to happen, Kyofu shouts worriedly at his friends, Peraza, Kori, Yogan! But it's already too late. Cell pierces Peraza's heart, causing her to free fall, spitting blood. Kori is hit with a golden energy cannon straight into her torso and is completely pierced. Cell was going to cut off Yogan's head, but he retreated in time. After escaping the attack that would kill him, Yogan explains how he did it. Yogan says, I can't see anything, but I can still hear. My hearing is keener than normal, so the slightest movement, even from a beast like you, is noticeable to my above average addition. Yogan retreats at full speed while saying to his companions, This is a good time for you to do something, Kyofu, Susei, and Mosukai. Hearing his companions call, Kyofu shouts, Last Gale! Lamenting the possible death of his friends, Kyofu begins to spin around himself, generating an insane gale that was turning the balance of Cell's fight technique shaken. Mosukai is next, devastating twigs. Mosukai summons many tree trunks from the island of monsters which travel through the skies, carried by the gale, locking Cell's body in a wooden prison. After doing so, Mosukai says to Kyofu, I think that's enough, Kyofu. Now let's leave everything in Susei's hands. Kyofu stops spinning, ending the wind. Susei directs his outstretched palm towards Cell's head who is trapped. Eager to see his leader put an end to it, Kyofu says, Have no mercy, Susei. Let's teach these damn earthlings a lesson. Susei yells, Droplets of blood. The pressure of high-speed droplets destroys Cell's head, at the same time that Mosukai's wooden prison falls apart. Susei says, Now, only the two boys are left. It looks like Takibe and Jinshin are having a hard time dealing with them on their own. But then to everyone's surprise, someone says, Now there are only three left. It's Cell's voice, which echoes as Mosukai and Kyofu bleed to death as they plummet before his eyes. After that, addressing Susei, Cell says, Surprised, bald bastard? My coarse cell was moved in time, so I was able to regenerate my body even after my head was destroyed. Furious, Susei curses his enemy while seeing the bodies of his allies fallen overboard. Damn it! You will pay dearly for such a humiliation! Filthy earthling, get ready to behold my ultimate transformation. Susei's body begins to glow in the process of transformation as he yells, Water divination! Blue-skinned, shimmering like water, the tribals of his bald head now spread over his arms. His thong became a petticoat that reached down to his skin, and on his wrists were now black bracelets with dark blue eyes. He looks at Cell without fear. Guiding both arms to chest height, he displays a small show of power. Suze says, See now, creature, what can a mere movement of my arms do? Suze asks as the sea around the monster island begins to churn violently. You were strong enough to make me use my transformation, something only one other person was able to do. So now suffer the consequences of it. Suze opens his mouth wide. Aquatic death! The fight between Cell and Susei continue high in the skies, making it rain on the island of monsters. Number 17 continued to protect the island's animals from the danger of the battle, while everyone watched from afar. He thinks, even though Cell has returned, their leader is a dangerous threat. As he watched the waves churn violently around the island of monsters, 17 thought, if that monster wants to, he can destroy this place in a heartbeat. If it continues like that, I will need to intervene. A blast of fire skims over the top of the trees, and along with it is a golden-haired warrior. Noting this, Seventeen thinks, Goten and Trunks seem to be in a very difficult fight against these two. I believe there are three of the strongest members of this organization. It can only be that, or they would already be defeated. While being pressured by his opponent, Goten thinks, Damn, he's too strong. Goten, even with the powers of Super Saiyan 2, is thrown against a rock that shatters, contemplating the blast of flames coming to meet him while deciding. I have to level up. He goes to the side, narrowly escaping death by charring, jumping to his feet and yells, Masenko! With his hands clasped to his forehead, he slams the golden energy cannon at Takebe, who is thrown into the air. After gaining some time, the boy thinks, I have to keep calm and be able to do this one more time, this time alone. Trunks covered by the Super Saiyan 2's lightning cloak dodges Jinshin's joined hand attack, which hit the ground which is split in half. 
Jinchen smiles, going for a smasher hug. Then Trunks jumps over his shoulder and quickly turns around while invoking the Big Bang attack, which hits the beast's back as it sinks into a crater. Jinchen gets up as if nothing had happened, even though his body is badly injured. Not seeing many options, Trunks thinks, if I want to have a chance to beat this bastard, I have to reach a new level. Trunks' muscles were shaking as he continued to think. Trunks says, Goten and I have always fought together, and with the fusion we were able to achieve incredible feats. But now these enemies have realized that they shouldn't let us fight side by side. We will have to reach our maximum powers by ourselves. We will have to risk our lives. Trunks tries to stay calm while taking a deep breath and concentrating. In the skies, Cell unleashes a Makan Kosapo that pierces the water sphere that Susei threw at him, rendering the attack useless. The waves of the sea coverage to the sea, generating a giant trident of water. The world starts to shake as the waves get more and more violent. Susei says, As you can see, the whole world trembles at my presence. Susei brags, wielding the giant water trident like it was nothing. Not even a powerful creature like you can stand up to that. I am the leader of the Nine Dominations, the candidate to become the next Celestial Mage. But with a calm expression, Cell says, Will you keep bragging, or will you pay attention to the true authors of this catastrophic manifestation? Cell's words leave Susei confused, and then the android clarifies his words for the mage. If the world is shaking and the waters are now churning like it's at war, that's the responsibility of just two boys. What was it? Are you so distressed that you can't say anything? Cell generates two energy discs in his hand, while Goten and Trunks reveal their deadly weapon. Overjoyed, Goten says, We finally got Trunks! Goten is panting as his golden hair falls below his waist. Trunks, sharing his friend's happiness, says, This will be our secret weapon to defeat these guys. Goten and Trunks finally reach the Super Saiyan 3 on their own, shaking the world's structures. At this moment, Susei, in his final formation, beholds the supreme awakening of the young warriors, being surprised by the effect it had on Earth. Surprised and furious, Susei says, So planet Earth trembles in the presence of these boys, and not in my presence? This is unforgivable. Simply unforgivable. Susei moves his trident and guides it towards Cell, who smirks. While dodging Susei's attacks and throwing a Kikoho at him, Cell asks, Did you think you'd invade this planet and get away with it? You got it wrong, you idiot! Goten walks through Takabe's torrent of flames as if it were nothing. With long flowing golden hair, no eyebrows, and green eyes, he glares at Takabe before hitting him with a direct kick to the chest, sending him flying. Goten reappears near the sea and punches him hard, hitting Takabe's back and shattering his armor as he launches him into the sky. At the top, Goten delivers a direct kick to his torso as he watches Takabe's body collide with the floor of the Island of Monsters. As he staggers to his feet, Takabe says, You damn! You knew you had all that power saved. You will pay for it. A cloak of flame envelopes Takabe's body as he shouts, Fire execution! He launches himself at full speed towards Goten, who came in a golden aura at full speed. Super Dragon Fists, says Goten. The clash occurs with both ending at opposite sides. The image of the golden serpent dragon manifests to the heavens while Takabe's mantle of fire is stopped as he falls to the ground. Goten won the fight. While happily celebrating his victory, the boy shouts, That's it! Now that we have awakened the Super Saiyan 3, we are invincible! Meanwhile, Trunks dodges Jishin's rain of rocks and then hits him with a direct punch to the face, sending him spinning through the air. Jishin retreats at full speed and expands his muscles, getting a monstrous appearance. As he lands a hand-clad blow directly to Trunks' head, the young Saiyan hybrid holds Jishin's joint fists with his arms and delivers a kick straight to his stomach, causing him to spit blood. Trunks with Super Saiyan 3 powers asks his opponent, Why are you so quiet? The cat ate your tongue? Shocked, Jishin asks, You earned a tremendous strength. How did you become so powerful? Don't tell me it's just because your hair grew. That's not possible. He blocks the first and second punches, but is then hit by the third and subsequent ones, ending up being thrown to the island's ground. Jishin, the pool blue, scaly skin colossus says, Damn it, I'll have to spend all my energy on this attack. Ground desolation! At that moment, the crust of the monster island he was standing on began to crumble and clump through the air. Trunks opens his arms, charging the golden energy as he says, If you are going to use your most powerful attack, I'm going to use mine too. Receive! Jishin exclaims. It's your end, boy. Jishin launches a gigantic rain of stones that materializes into spheres of white energy, following a ritual of destruction. But Trunks doesn't stand still and yells, Final Flash! Trunks brings his arms in front of his body and fires a colossal golden energy cannon. In the blink of an eye, the energy sweeps the Jishin spheres as if they were nothing, heading towards the same one who had no reaction time. 
Jishin is consumed by Trunks' power fading away. Jishin ended up knocking out in the middle of the destroyed ground, while Trunks, with a smile on his face, nods positively to Goten, who also ends his match. Susei contemplates his water trident being destroyed by Cell's Kamehameha, having to resort to hand-to-hand -to -hand combat. Both were in a fierce fight of punches and kicks until Cell finds a gap and hits him with a right hook, causing him to retreat a few meters before launching a golden energy attack that throws Susei's body away. Cell guides his index and middle fingers towards his forehead, charging a golden energy as he says, Get ready, mage. Makan Kosapo! The spiraling energy flows into Susei's body when the attack was about to pierce him. Someone kicks the attack to the side and places himself in the line of fire, saving him from death. That person was Yogan, the domination of lava. Seeing Yogan again, Cell comments, So you're still alive after all. Yogan replies, Not only am I alive, but my blindness from your previous attack is also gone. Yogan spits out blood as he reveals the hole in his body caused by the Makan Kosapo. Susei, mouth open, watched him. Yogan says to his leader, Lord Susei, prepare your most powerful attack. I'll take care of him in the meantime. Yogan takes off at full speed, leaving Susei behind. With a proud smile from his subordinate, Susei says, Who knew that out of all of them, you'd be the one to stand by my side in the end? Susei gets into position, placing his arms at chest height and legs apart, while invoking the ocean waters generating a large wall of water behind him, which manifests soon after as gigantic spears of water. Susei says, water obliteration. At the same time, Yogan shouts, lava explosion. Yogan sweeps the place where Cell was with his lava. However, the monster is unharmed when it regenerates, sinking his claws into Yogan's body as it faces him mercilessly. Mortally wounded, but with great hope in his leader's victory, Yogan says, it's useless, Cell. You lost. Yogan's body falls while Cell saw the thousands of water spears with their sharp points on the horizon. He brings his right arm forward, clenching his left fist as he slightly arches his leg as a flickering red flash takes over his body. The android yells, Kaioken! Cell, now with his power multiplied, faced Susei's fury, heading towards the shower of spears, dodging them all as if they were nothing. Thought it would be the end of me, right? Said Cell. With Cell under the Kaioken's red cloak, delivers a direct kick to Susei's face, who blocks it with his left hand while saying, My target was never you. Susei grins evilly as the rain of spears pierces 17 shields, wrecking havoc on the monster island. After that, he says, By now, those young warriors have already been defeated by my powers, and that means all that's missing is you, you damn worm. A final spear descends from the sky, impaling Cell's head as he falls back inanimate. Behind Susei, Goten, Trunks, and Number 17 appear, firing cannons of golden energy. He is hit by the attacks, free-falling until he hits the ground. Cell reappears unharmed, still under the red cloak of the Kaioken. He says, Looks like you didn't see through our strategy, did you? That's the advantage of our hard training. He points the palm of his hand at Susei's head, which has returned to its base form. Cell asks, your last words. Susei raises his hand, manipulating the water away from there, and he says, We... we'll be back. We will ascend and exterminate everyone. Susei shoots to the side in a swoop. When he guides the bodies of the eight dominations defeated in battle to the skies, surrounded by water spheres, Susei flees, shooting at full speed and disappearing into the sky. Cell had deactivated the Kaioken, displaying a slight smile as he saw Trunks and Goten deactivate the Super Saiyan 3. Number 17 approaches and says, Glad that in the end everything worked out. That damn thing is gone, and the island is safe. Now we'll just have to reforest some parts and terraform the ground in others. But other than that, not one animal was killed, so it's okay. Number 17 displays a smile from the corner of his mouth. Number 17 says, Looks like the training paid off. Earth has powerful guardians now. Excited Goten says, Training is just beginning. Super Saiyan 3 will not be our limits. Right, Trunks? Trunks agrees and says, Of course not. Soon we will attain godlike powers just like our parents. That is, if Cell agrees to help us with our training again. Cell nods, clenching his fists. They restart training at that very moment. Cell says, Let's break our limits. After crossing the hyper dimension and heading to an inviolable path that led to his masters, Susei arrives at the abode of the celestial mages. Now kneeling before Odisu, the mage of the elements, surrounded by the bodies of his companions, he laments. Susei says, Unfortunately, we underestimate the enemy, Lord Odisu. Susei struggled not to succumb to the terror of the presence of the celestial mages. Susei says, A fusion of seven warriors was carried out, which resulted in our downfall. 
I know this is unforgivable. So if this is my end, I'll gladly accept it. Odisu notes, Jishin and Takibe are also alive. The others are already dead. I don't see any point in saving them. I could destroy them right here and now. But since you didn't beg for your life, I think it's worth giving you a second chance. Odisu lifts Jishin and Takibe's body into the air and sucks all their vital energy. He kills them, guiding that energy into Susei's body. After doing so, he says, With that, you already have enough power. Susei asks without looking directly at Odisu, My lord, to what do I owe this honor? Odisu explains, You already have enough power to start celestial training. Susei, Odisu reveals, leaving Susei dumbfounded. If your ambition is to become a celestial mage, you will need to become more powerful. You will be our secret weapon for the final battle for the Seven Kingdoms. Susei stands up after Odisu beckons him to do so, and extending his arm. And then he says, I see. I will give my life for the mission of the Celestial Mages. I will become so powerful that I will crush those three with a single blow. The determination of Susei, the warrior who aspired to become a Celestial Mage, is recognized by Odisu, his master. While this training begins, another was already taking place far away. Son Goku faced Kakarot, now immense in a lucid dream on the planet Vegeta, where his father, Bardock, and his mother, Jinne, are still alive. 